Okay, great. Let's talk about this. So we're going to be talking how dyslexia affects math. And um, I think you'll find a lot of what I'm going to share tonight is very interesting. Um, and then in November, I'll be talking about dyscalculia. Um, so if you want to sign up for that webinar as well, we'll be talking more about what true dyscalculia looks like um, and how you can help students with that. Okay, let's get going. So get ready to drop some thoughts in the chat. I love this cartoon. It just cracks me up. So it says, I'd like to meet you halfway, but I'm terrible with fractions. So my question is, how many of you in general can relate to that idea? Um, I know that a lot of adults feel like they're terrible at math and it's just socially acceptable too, if we find that. Like there, I have uh, many conversations where I'll tell people what I do and suddenly all these adults are confessing, you know, they're terrible at math. I can barely balance my checkbook. Um, so let me know in the chat. Are you, can you relate to that? Do you feel like, eh, yeah, my math skills could probably be a little bit better. Um, and that's an interesting thing because here in the United States, it's totally socially acceptable to be bad at math. Whereas with reading and writing and spelling, um, that's more problematic in the eyes of most Americans. And we view that as something that's like top priority and all of that, which is true. I agree, we should be taking care of those problems, but math is equally important. It drives the world. It's really important for um, you know, financial literacy. I was just talking to some people today about how many people do not have the financial literacy that's needed. And that's because of our math skills in general as, as a country. So thank you, thank you for commenting. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, so tonight, what our goal is, here's my plan, here's what we'll cover. Is it dyscalculia? Is it, you know, some other learning issue? What is it that's causing these problems with math? And we'll talk more directly about how it's dyslexia. True dyscalculia is really quite rare and I'll explain a little bit, but not go too deep because we're gonna do a whole nother presentation about that. And then we'll discuss what processes are needed to be successful in math. There's quite a few um, and I didn't even list all of them. I listed, oh, probably five, I think, um, that really make a big difference. And then I'm gonna show you how dyslexia affects math and give you some quick tips that you can use to help your child or to help yourself if you're struggling with math as well. And so first, let's just talk about this. So true dyscalculia. I'm using that terminology because true dyscalculia, in my definition, this isn't something that's been studied or reported, but after working with these children for so long, I've seen some very big patterns show up with kids that have true dyscalculia. We know that about six, when we see various stats on this, because it depends on your definition of dyscalculia, but between um, five to 8% of school-age children have dyscalculia. So I, I said, you know, really it's about six. That's maybe one or two students out of a classroom. A lot of students are being classified as having it that don't necessarily um, have all of the deficits that I would, I would say are indicative of true dyscalculia. So if we look at like a standard deviation, um, here in the middle is the average, the norm of what we're looking for. And it usually falls in the lower range to the upper range of normal. And the student with true dyscalculia in all the areas that we can test, they typically are falling out here in the outliers, down here, um, even off of this curve. And that is a true uh, dyscalculia. And we can talk about that in the next webinar because there's a lot of hallmarks that we look for. But basically in all of their testing, everything is delayed. And looking at some of the testing, this is a test that we do in-house here. Um, some of the families that we have served, if you're here tonight, you've seen this kind of data before. But again, you can see that there are strengths within the deficits. You can see here that this particular student, they went above average in this um, skill set. And then here they're meeting average, but everywhere else is delayed. And so that tells us a lot about the student that they do have dyscalculic tendencies. Um, and when we see true dyscalculia, there is no bars that really meet that average between 90 and 110. Everything's down here. Some of it barely registers. And working with a student like that is extremely different than working with a student who has dyslexia. When we have students with dyslexia, what their data actually looks like is typically this. 
they have scores that are approaching average, um, but then they typically have this visual spatial score that is like off the charts. They are so great at visualizing things in their head and seeing the big picture, and they score really high on this, and this is their strength. And so we use this when we're teaching our students um, to build all of these other skills and help them get closer to that average, to the functional grade level that they should be at. So an interesting thing to note is that dyslexia definitions have changed over time. Um, in 1988, there was a definition at one time in the US that did include mathematics as, as an issue in its definition. Um, and I got this, this little tidbit and research from uh, the book called Mathematics for Dyslexics and Dyscalculics. Um, but definitions in the UK used to include it and other countries that there was difficulties with math. And then as we got closer to the year 2000, you start seeing a removal of mathematic difficulties and they were trying to separate that. And so a lot of people think that dyslexia is only a language-based issue but it does affect math. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that tonight. But as we know, the struggles with math, there's a lot of co-occurring conditions. It's really difficult to tease out what those issues are. There's just true dyscalculia. So a child could have dyslexia and dyscalculia, true dyscalculia. They could also have dyspraxia, and I mentioned dyslexia, ADHD, and sensory processing issues, sometimes even autism. So all of these things, it's difficult for us to tease it out. But um, through our testing, we're able to really get clear on what the students' strengths are and use those to help our students. So let's talk about those processes uh, for co-occurring um, conditions. Oh, and I forgot math anxiety. Sometimes we even find students who actually have normal scores they can't pe perform in school because of their math anxiety. It's just off the charts. Um, and those kids, once we get that under control, they can thrive in a normal classroom. But sometimes students have all of it. OK, so the processes that you need to be successful in math, we're going to go over these tonight. You need to have language and verbal retrieval skills. You got to have a strong working memory. And you need to be efficient. Your speed of working can really inhibit your ability to move forward. Your executive functioning skills, and we'll talk about more what those are. And then visual spatial skills and where some of the issues that lie. And I just said in a previous slide that we do have kids that have fantastic visual spatial skills, but they do have issues in certain areas that fall under that umbrella. So let's talk more about the language and verbal retrieval skills. Okay, so let's do a little exercise. When you have a child with dyslexia, often they learn to read by typing, typing, sorry, tying a word to an image. So for example, pencil. So a student with dyslexia will see that word and go, okay, I'm gonna tie that to a pencil. I know what that is. But students with dyslexia tend to skip over words like the and of because there is no visual that can be tied to that. Does anyone here have a child with dyslexia that tends to skip over words like that? The, is, and? <laughs> I have a kiddo that does that. And it can significantly impact you when you're working on math. So think about this word of. If you have dys dyslexia, you have a tendency of maybe skipping this word. It has really no meaning to you. So you gloss over it. But when you get to math, think about this. If I'm taking half of four, the child's lost because now they're like, what of? Like what's of doing in math? And that's very confusing. And so it's important that we teach these meanings of these little words. I'm taking half of four. And you can see visually that we've got half of four shaded. So the other piece that's tricky here is the working memory skills. So Sean Belock and her team studied the brain through MRI imaging and found that math facts are held in the working memory section of the brain. So what happens is the brain goes and retrieves that information in the long term and it holds it in the working memory. 
And where it's going to retrieve those math facts can be different based on which ones they're using. So if they're looking for addition and subtraction, that's in the numeracy part of the brain in the math more, more strong math sense part. However, multiplication and division is in the language hemisphere of the brain, which tells us that how the brain makes sense of those two, two types of mathematical thinking changes how it's stored. And so the student may be spending a lot of their working memory trying to find and retrieve those math facts, especially multiplication and division. So a lot of you have probably struggled with a child that's really not able to do their multiplication facts quickly. If that's the case, please share so in the, in the comments. I would love to hear from you. Multiplication math facts are a big issue for a lot of students. And then division just makes it even worse since we're undoing it. Um, and this is why, because of that working memory, because it's an issue for our students with dyslexia. So working memory, we have an inner eye. Okay, the inner eye. Visual information is used here. Many of our students have a very strong visual memory. So if we tie math facts, multiplication math facts with a visual, it's more likely that they're going to remember it. And when I say visual, I'm not talking about the symbol, the numbers, three times four, I'm talking about a visual of that quantity. Um, and maybe it's an area model with three across the top and four down the side. They need that inner eye that helps them go and find that information if it's stored in a way that's visual. So the inner eye is used for mental math and understanding magnitude. So how big or how small a number is, and this is the inner eye at work. Then we have the inner voice, and that is used for finding and using those math facts in the names and tying that visual that they have in their mind to the symbol, the number they need to write on the paper. And that can become a big struggle. <clears throat> so a child may be thinking of the number but struggles to write it down from that inner voice if they have a weak inner voice. And that final, the final piece of this um, is executive function, which we'll talk about in length, but this is what working memory is at its core. So it's frustrating for a student with dyslexia who has very strong visual processing in their mind to tie it to those abstract ideas of numbers and symbols and be able to spit that out on a piece of paper. It actually is quite slow for them to be able to do that because they're such visual thinkers. So let's look at that a little bit more about that speed of working. So I've got a question for you. How many of your children are completely overwhelmed by a time test where speed and accuracy is required? I'm gonna take a drink real quick. And while I'm drinking, go ahead and chat. So when my child um, who has dyslexia, when he was learning his math facts, we tried out this popular program um, the name of it's escaping me. It has an alien in it and the numbers show up on the screen and it's a time test and you can see this clock going down and there's really emotional music about how fast he's going. He completely shut down, could not do it. He was bawling during this game. It was not fun at all because of the time and the speed and the accuracy. So performing under that pressure, the time pressure is huge. So Elizabeth Brown says, yes, she can't or cannot perform under the stress of a time test, yes. And Dai says it shuts him down, absolutely. It absolutely does. And that is so anxiety provoking. I know that I feel stress when I'm timed to do something. I'm not very fast and I'm a lot like my students. I'm very visual in my thinking. So dyslexic students, they take 50% longer to complete or attempt stopping at a task. So students with dyslexia, because I think they're, this is my personal belief. <laughs> this isn't proven by science, but this is my belief and what I've observed. They're so visual that it's taking a long time for them to translate that into a symbolic way out onto the paper and they're willing to keep trying keep trying and so that's part of why it takes them so long to complete something but also to stop trying at whatever problem that they're doing so this slowness impedes their fluency in reading spelling and their arithmetic and the demand for speed induces that anxiety and slows down that working memory the ability to go retrieve the information and bring it in and use it 
And so I wanted to share with you the information processing model. Now, this is how the brain learns. And it starts up here with attention. And then it comes down and it's actually processed sensory wise. So if you've got a child um, with vision issues, uh, I know that we've, there's students that need um, colored glasses. One of my business coaches has to wear a yellow colored lens in his glasses because the sensory input's too much from the world he works in. Um, or auditory issues. We've got kids with sensory processing um, issues, auditory issues, and then kinesthetic. Um, again, some of our kids are very clumsy and they struggle with cross body movement. I haven't seen anyone have any issues with the olfactory system, but the body processes everything sensory wise through your five senses. And if we're, ha if we're lucky enough to get past this, we get their attention and it gets past all of those things, then the amygdala starts to, sh to shed light on this situation that we're in. Are we safe? Am I going to have to run away from this? And a time test can induce that anxiety and make the amygdala go, oh no, 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 I'm not dealing with this, I'm not dealing with this. And it shuts everything down. No more working memory to go retrieve information from that long-term memory. And so the time test induce that anxiety. And the slowness can actually cause a misdiagnosis of dyscalculia because of timed factors. That's also something that I don't think a lot of parents know is that when you take your child to a neurologist or a diagnostician, the tests that they're administering have a timed factor to them, whether they share that information or not with your child. And so a lot of students will get flagged with having dyscalculia, even though they probably could have gotten the answer had they been given about that 50% more time, they could have arrived at the answer. So this you know, really limits what our students with dyslexia can do when they're in a timed constraint. So let's talk about executive function. So executive function, if you haven't heard of this before, is the ability to carry out a plan, to understand what the issue is or the project that needs to be done. It could be cleaning your room, it could be doing a homework assignment. And there are, steps steps and sequences that have to happen and that's called executive function and if i go back executive function is all of this it's all of this and being able to have control over your mind and your senses and your emotional response that's executive function okay so let's talk a little bit closer about that just to shed some light on what's really required and i didn't even put in all of the steps here just to do some math homework so the first thing I, I, like I said earlier, it starts with focus. Once we get the child focused, do they understand what the homework was that was given to them? Do they, do they understand the expectations? Then second, do they know how to record it accurately, write the assignment accurately in their planners? So this is when they're still at school. Can they take what the teacher said and wrote on the board and actually translate it into their planner correctly? There's a lot that can happen there in between that short time. And then the third thing is, can they remember? When they get home to you, can they remember to check that planner for homework? Did they even think to look? I think that is the biggest battle at our house. We struggle to remember to look, all of us, including the parents. <laughs> then the fourth part is the work. The student has to show initiative, that task initiation, that they're going to get started on that homework. And a lot of students with dyslexia are going to avoid it because they know it's A, gonna take longer, and B, they're gonna feel unsuccessful almost the entire time that they're doing it because they have such a visual brain and it's just too much time and effort to get it down into numbers. Then the fifth step was memory. Can they even recall how to do the homework? How did their teacher want them to do it? And then six, we gotta do attention again. They have to maintain the focus on that homework assignment. Can they even finish the whole thing? Then we have to check it, make sure we did it right and then label it. Uh, my family struggles with no name papers. <laughs> Does the student miss credit because they just forgot to put their name on it? And then heaven forbid, let's, let's pray. It's on a prayer you know, at my house that the homework actually makes it to the school to get turned in. If you opened one of my child's backpacks right now, it looks like a tornado you know, just blew through there. But I clean it out every single weekend, but every day it looks like this. It looks just horrendous. And then there's three more steps that I could think of. Um, the student has to find that binder again when they're at school to open it up and go turn in the homework. 
and we're just, you know, having issues with that travel, the student takes the backpack with them to get their schoolwork turned in. And let's pray that teachers have a fairly standardized way of turning in their homework, but most teachers don't. They all have different spots and locations in their classroom, and your child is likely to get it mixed up about where the homework goes, and it's difficult to get things turned in. And this isn't even really all of the steps. I didn't even talk about the math mayhem that could ensue executive function-wise. And so that's an issue for our students with dyslexia. But some quick tips that I can share for that with the executive function is to cut all the clutter. So I mentioned that I clean out my child's backpack. Yes, I know this is a life skill. <laughs> he should learn how to do it, but there's a time and a place for it. And often it's just better for you to take care of it and include them when they're in a low anxiety state, not when anxiety is high, to organize the information so they know where to find it, but help them standardize some of the things that they're doing. And so cutting the clutter in their backpack, cutting their clutter in their room, whatever you can do to help the study space that they're using. Um, I even took it as far as the backpack that we use has one pocket. You know those backpacks that have like five different places you could put things inside? We got rid of that. We cut, we cut the clutter, one pocket, nothing gets lost anymore because of that. It gets crumpled, but it's not lost. Another simple way to cut the clutter is actually through your worksheets. And I'll show you some examples of that. Try to help. Um, you could advocate at the school or you could take care of this yourself, but the worksheet shouldn't have more than two to four problems on each worksheet. Um, and you'll see this when you work with us here at Made for Math. It's typically one math problem on the screen, maybe two. We never do a bunch because it's just too much executive function that gets taken to try to process visually what's happening. And then cutting the clutter in your environment. Um, is really helpful. So if your child's working on their homework, try to put them in a room where cooking dinner isn't happening. And I know that's hard because you most of us have to multitask to survive <laughs> in this world. But cooking dinner is a distraction. Having a sibling in the same room playing with their phone or playing videos is a distraction. Try to remove any environmental clutter that you can from sounds to sights. And um, that, that should help tremendously. And then the language that you use when you're talking about math, try to cut the clutter in that as much as possible. Use as minimal language as you can. And I'll show you a little bit more about that later. And then routines, try to stick to your routine with how you do your homework, what time of day you do your homework, how you approach and start your homework. These things help the brain know to anticipate and plan for these patterns to appear. The brain loves patterns. And so if you can encourage that with your child, it will help their executive functioning. There's a whole plethora of things we could do here and that's probably a whole nother webinar we could do. Um, but for today, I'll stop right there. So another piece that's inside of executive functioning that's an issue is sequencing. That is a big problem for a lot of our students. Long division. <laughs> This is such a hard topic to teach. And here in this example, this is a great way to line it up and work with a student. But typically what we see at the school is this is the kind of stuff that comes home to you. And if we look at this from a clutter aspect, there's a lot of language on the page. There's a lot of numbers to look at. Um, there's a lot going on. And this is a uh, solving variables thing. But um, even with division, we're seeing lots of lengthy things being sent home. And students struggle with this. Students with dyslexia struggle with the sequential ordering of the steps that need to be done for long division or solving for a variable. That's really difficult for them. So some tips for sequencing and steps, that kind of stuff. We try to keep it really short and snappy, just you chunk it. These are buttons that we use to teach long division. And we get it to the point where the student has this nearby to help them remember the steps. And we have some gross motor movements that we do to it. That's really helpful is to create that visual and add the movement. And that helps the brain rely on that strength of theirs. And then they can remember the sequencing because they have this. And we refer to this as a near point reference, meaning it's close by to them, not hung on a wall in a classroom. It's right there on their desk. They can refer to it and look at it and use it. 
If you've got an older student, again, giving them ample graph paper, lots of space can help. And then out here to the side, writing down the steps in as little words as possible, what's needed to be done. Um, another one, another algebra example is when we're solving two-step equations. This is um, terminology that we got from Marilyn Zecker, but we've, we've changed it a little bit for our team. But the first step would be, who's messing with my x? So we're trying to get the focus on the variable. And then how are they messing with the x? Well, what operation's happening? And then what's the opposite operation? That's the next step. And then finally, we apply it to both sides. The cool thing about this is this can start out a little bit more um, cluttered, but get down to just pictures and the words who, how, opposite, both sides, which that has a nice pa uh, pattern in voice, right? Who, how, opposite, both sides. And our students totally love this. They remember it, no more forgetting. And it's really, really helpful. And these images can stay in their mind. And it's a whole lot more accessible than all the language that we have out here. Okay, so then the next uh, processy that's just super important is that visual spatial, which I did rec which I did say was a big strength for a lot of our students, but there are some micro issues inside that can cause problems, and those are directionality and position, vision dis difficulties, and just spatial awareness. So, how many of you had a child that struggled to learn to tie their shoes? I'm going to take a drink again. And tell me in the chat how many of your children struggled to learn to tie their shoes. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth says trouble here. Julie says yes. Yeah, me too. 12 and still doesn't. <laughs> Oh, Janine, yes, 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 it's so hard. I'm sorry I laughed, but yes, because I know I can relate to the struggle. Um, I'm so grateful that they make so many cool shoes that are just slip on, right? So yes, I can relate. I had a child that it took a long time to teach them to tie their shoes, and they still do it in kind of a strange way. It's still not the way I taught them. It still isn't the best knot, but it is so hard. And this is that directionality piece at play with the way their brains is wired, their brain is wired. Directionality is difficult, the left and right, the top and bottom, all of that's really hard. I saw this quote once from Leslie Templeton and it's just really stuck with me. So this is what she had to say. My dyslexia makes it difficult to understand sequencing and directionality. I don't know left, right, and up, down. These take me a second to process. Also now, then, here, there, before, after, and so on really confuse me. And that directionality is important in mathematics. In young children, being able to share which shape is above the square is hard for them. Or how about which shape is before the star? This, this kind of terminology actually makes a big difference when you're talking in math. So we have to practice these skills because it's super important. It's a directional heavy activity. We need them to know left and right, top, bottom. Those are important and I'll show you why. So think about the direction of adding numbers and how it compares to what we do in reading. When we read text, we're going from left to right, top to bottom. In math, we don't follow this directional pattern. We start all the way to the left, and we identify the operation and then we shift all the way over to the right. And then we come down from the top and we move from the right to the left. That is confusing. And again, I mentioned earlier that the brain likes patterns. This pattern does not make sense to our children that are learning how to read and read is such a reading is such a difficulty for them. So when this enters in, they're like, what? I, this doesn't make sense. So think about our number lines too. It's tied closely to di the directionality of reading. The numbers grow larger as we scan from left to right. Okay, that makes sense, right? A child with dyslexia could relate to that. Okay, left to right. But often when the negative numbers get applied, 
the directionality no longer applies. What? Now I can start in the middle and I can go to the left or to the right? That's very confusing for our students. So when we work with integers as a team, we actually introduce a vertical number line because it follows more of a natural law and makes sense to their mind. When we go up the line, the quantity increases. And when we go down, it decreases. And a lot of elementary schools have number lines on the desk, but they always start with zero. They never show students the numbers below, and this messes with their ability to understand that directionality. It's important to expose children to this early because when they get to high school and we're doing matrices, directionality goes a whole nother level. <laughs> It's a directionality heavy activity. And when I was in high school, I had mega anxiety about doing matrices because I couldn't keep the rules straight. It was too much for me. And so we have to explicitly practice the terminology of columns and rows with students left to right, top and bottom. So let's talk quickly about some things you can do to help with that directionality and position. And it involves gross motor. So with your child, um, we have some simple activities that we can do here. And uh, let, me, let me read all of my notes. I'm so sorry. I got lost on which slide I was on there for a second. So some of the things that you can do here um, is drawing in large movements on your child's back. Now, this is our number one video on YouTube, and you can go look this up. Um, and what we're teaching in this video is how you can do gross motor to help your child with number reversals. Number reversals are common again because of that directionality. They don't remember where do I start. You'll see your child hovering in the air and they're not really sure where that pencil should go. So to help fix that, you actually have your child sit down in front of you and you draw the numerals on their back. And your child, because of the way they're wired, that makes sense to them because it's easy for them to transfer the sensation they had on their back directly down to the piece of paper in front of them. And that's really, really helpful. Again, I mentioned that vertical number line. We actually use big tubes, the core of the wrapping paper to help our students with grasping that quantity, especially when we're working with negatives because they can put their hands and go up and down when they're adding and subtracting. Really, really helpful. Um, and then with a student that I was tutoring, doing those matrices, we practiced the explicit language of columns and rows and then cardinal positions like first, second, third. And so I could say things like put the puppy in the second column and in the first row. So we would practice that and we would interchange the words and all of that so that they were listening closely to what the language was and then we'd practice it with it written out in language. You have to be explicit with these kids and they really can blossom and understand what they need to do because a matrices is quite easy. We're just multiplying, but it's the order in which you do it that matters. Okay, so then we have the vision difficulty. So a lot of our students skim read <laughs> Again, they and they see words like of and is and the, it's not important, so they skip over it. But when we get to math, if the operations are kind of written sloppily, a student will be scanning and these three look so similar that they may not even recognize that this is addition, division, and multiplication. They may interchangeably use them and that's difficult. So one way to, to fix that would be to use clay and build them with your hands, but also when you're doing the actual math, slowing down and circling the operations. Another directionality thing that comes up are sixes and nines. Because they're such visual thinkers and they can spin um, objects in their mind and see them from multiple angles, sixes and nines can be really confusing. And they may even think six, but write nine on their paper. And so that, again, is something that you have to explicitly teach. And that handwriting on your back part can really help them. And even three and five are a little too similar. The top part here would be really easy to reverse. And so again, practicing that with the gross motor can help. But as you get older, this can become problematic. 
this in the eyes of a child with dyslexia is the same. And so we have to help them visually see that there's a slight difference, that this is a superscript up in the sky and this is not. And that's really important. Elizabeth shared that six and nine were so confusing. Yes, they really are. Another thing to Elizabeth, I'll say this for other parents. If we can teach the kids not to make a nine with a curl, let's do a circle and a stick. That is really helpful too, instead of doing a nine like this. And then being really aware when you're making a material for your child, what does the nine look like? And if it looks like this, change it for a different font that does not have a nine that looks like this. Okay, moving forward. So the other thing with the visual processing is think about our worksheets. This presentation style of a worksheet is the worst. It's confusing and it's overwhelming for our students, especially because the items are all written so close together. And a lot of our students with dyslexia also write really sloppy. They write really big. There's not enough room for them to do their work here. So this interaction too between the short-term memory and the spatial tracking on this page can cause a student to copy work wrong even. So they may have it next to them, but they're transferring it over to another sheet of paper. It is likely they're going to lose what numbers they were writing over here on this page. It's really, really difficult. So tips for that vision difficulty. Um, we had talked about circling the operation huge really important you don't just do it in the primary grades you do it for the older kids too circling those negatives circling the subtraction signs addition subtraction multiplication division maybe you're circling superscript you know powers those kinds of things that really helps our students for our younger students we have kind of a um i don't know how you want to say it but a sing-songy way so what we say to our students is you circle the sign circle the sign follow the line, this is where we begin, okay? And we say it over and over, circle the sign, follow the line, this is where we begin. And that helps them hang on to that. That's a useful bit of language so that they can remember the direction of addition. The other thing you can do is have minimal problems on the page. So this is an example from um, working with us plenty of room to write on this digital whiteboard. And this is called bit paper. We highly recommend using a digital whiteboard because the writing space is infinite. The students can, if they run out of space, scroll down and make more room for their writing and thinking. This is really, really helpful for these students. And so two problems per page, especially if you're doing a digital board, we prefer actually one in most cases, especially for younger students. Uh, if you're older, we can do two, but once you reach algebra level, one problem per page, that's it. They need that visual space to circle, draw the lines that they need and rewrite parts. They need lots of space for all of that. The other issue that we have is spatial awareness. So a lot of our students have terrible alignment issues. They're not really sure where to put the digits or where to start. And we see this a lot where they'll put the three haphazardly in between these two. And then when they subtract, they miss this one for bringing it down, which is really, really problematic. And so the, the math can go wrong. It's not that they don't understand how to do it. It's that they lack that spatial awareness and understanding that they need to line it up. Another place that we see this problem with is graphing in older students. I mentioned that the pencil hovers. This happens a lot. When you see an older student hovering with their pencil, they really don't know where to put that pencil and they lack that one-to-one -one correspondence too of understanding that I'm gonna touch a line and that that is how many spots I'm moving. And it's really difficult for our students that are working in negatives. Um, so graphing is a particularly exhausting um, bit of work for our students with dyslexia. So to help with spatial awareness, um, this again is bit paper. We turned on the grid view here. What I love about bit paper is you can make the grids as big as you need. So the student has plenty of room for writing. And we put out near point references here. So this particular problem was working on three. So we put the multiples of three to the side and then those buttons for the students to use to help them remember the steps. And then everything's in column form. They can clearly see where that number needs to go. It needs to go inside this box and they don't miss uh, align things, which is really important. And then with the graphing part, again, we love bit paper because I can make this graph so much bigger 
If we go back to this example, this graph is borderline too little for a student with, with dyslexia. They need bigger graphs. And so we like using bit paper for this reason. We can make these boxes as big as we want. I think this particular size is a 60 by 60, which is really helpful. So let's move on to um, what are the signs that your child probably needs help with math? You've been so focused on the reading side, um, but now you're noticing maybe that there's some issues with math, but you're not sure to what extent that happens a lot. So let's talk about this together. So finger counting, that happens a lot. Are they counting on their fingers? Are they miscounting on their fingers? Some kids even struggle with that and they count a thumb twice or a pinky twice. They struggle with that. Do they know they have five fingers on one hand and on the other? Some kids don't know this. That's called the fiveness of five. And I have a fiveness of five shirt on today. Do they understand what five is? Uh, moving their fingers, but they count in or, in or inaccurately. You know, that one-to-one -one correspondence ties directly back to that graphing. It may seem like it's not important to master it now, but it will hurt them in the future where they're trying to do some graphing. That's one-to-one -one correspondence too. And then are they counting the dots on dominoes and dice? We see that. Like there will be kids that will roll a dice and they will get their pointer finger out and start counting the dice dots, which is not good. So what we're trying to teach them is stronger visualizing and tying that to the, the numerals, to the symbol. Do they sub-vocalize? Do they talk under their breath as they work? Do they whisper talk to themselves? Is the whisper talk mostly counting? That's a telltale sign. Like there's a lot going on there. If they're talking to themselves and it's just counting. Uh, the visualizing. Do they have to look up in the air? Your kids are such strong visualizers. So they're looking up in the air. They're trying to see the numbers. Um, we also see a lot of looking down at the ground. They're trying to visualize what's going on. Not that that's problematic. It's just a good sign that your child probably has spatial reasoning that's like off the chart gifted. And so it makes math a little slower because it's such an abstract idea. Another big one is time. Do you have a child that struggles with time? Maybe they don't have a sense of time, even how long 30 minutes feels or multiple um, hours in a day. Do they understand the days and the weeks and the month? Can they tell time on an analog clock? Um, that's a big one. And if you've got a child that's still struggling with time, let me know because we're going to run some more classes for that. The way we teach time is so unique that a lot of kids get it very quickly. Um, it just makes sense to them after they learn it this way. Magnitude. Do they understand how big numbers are? Do they understand quantity? That fiveness of five is the building block to understanding what a billion looks like. Do they understand place value? Big, big numbers. And do they understand small numbers, fractional parts, very small pieces? So the key to helping your child with all of this is multi-sensory math. Your child is gifted with a spatial, um, visual spatial mind. They think in pictures, they think in 3D objects. It's really, really helpful for them to do what's called CRA. So CRA is concrete, stuff you touch in your hands. R is the picture, that's what you're looking at here. And A is the abstract, just the numbers. And sadly, most of the instruction in America is mostly A. We've tried and tried and tried to move teachers toward the C and the R, but because of how they were taught and because so many people feel shame about their math abilities, we're struggling as a society to change this because this is the hallmark of good teaching. It is important for all learners. It's essential for our students with dyslexia it's essential for our students with autism and ADHD. It makes a world of difference. It's just good teaching. So if you're looking for some resources about this, there's three books that I recommend. Um, they're typically the two colorful ones, the red and blue one. Those are more meant for students sixth grade and under. They are not for the older students, um, but inside there's games to play. Um, even the assessment piece is more game-like, but you would get a very good sense of what the students look doing and how they're thinking. And um, 
make a plan for that intervention to help your child. And then Mathematics for Dyslexics and Dyscalculics. I adore this book. It's heavy in research, I will warn you, but it is very, what's the word? Satisfactory for me to read it because it is proof that what we do actually works. He's saying everything that I've been saying for a very long time. He believes a lot of the same things as I do, but he has taken the exhaustive work to back it up with research. So um, that's a really helpful book. If you like that kind of stuff, I highly recommend it. So there is curriculum out there that does support that CRE approach. Matthew C is one. Math's no problem. This is UK program. However, it's the same math. You can use it. They just maths. Um, the only other difference would be they don't call it a one, they call it a unit. And that makes sense because of the metric system over there. And then there's bridges here. I love bridges, but it's only available to schools. But if you're a parent who's looking for some, just type in bridges home connection into an internet search. All sorts of workbooks show up with fantastic visuals for your child. You could do the concrete piece on your own, but then there's pictures that really help. My complaint about that curriculum is the pages are busy and they don't do what's called supatizing. So supatizing is when you um, take a quantity and arrange it into a pattern like the dice on my shirt, a tally mark, for example. Supatizing is really important for our kids. And then the last one is CPM. Um, same complaint, worksheets too busy, font too small, <laughs> but it does use the CRA approach. But there is no perfect curriculum out there. As a team, we're constantly making our own things and pulling from multiple resources. Um, there just isn't a one one size fits all, you know, every, every learner is different. So there really shouldn't be, but there are not very many that do what we hold to our standard. And so we have to change a lot of it to make it to our standard. So you might also be wondering about if, I know we have an educator here with us tonight, if you wanna learn more about this method, who trained us as a team is Marilyn Zecker and she is ongoingly helping us, training us, um, mentoring us. And then as a team, everyone on our team, we're always doing um, training and making sure we're up to date. We have a, a lot of support going on and lots of cheering from Marilyn. She's really proud of us and what we're making here. Um, so check her out. And then there's Making Math Real out of California. Uh, the cost for doing Making Math Real is significantly higher than Marilyn, just FYI. And they don't do anything virtual. You have to go to them. I haven't checked, though, during the pandemic to see if he finally changed his mind about that. But he's really limiting people on getting the methods um, by requiring you to be in California for weeks on end. It's not just a weekend. It's weeks on end to be there. And then there's Wooden Math and Mortensen Math. Um, both of those are excellent. And feel free to Google and check those out. And I just wanted to share with you um, this example of a student that we worked with. So you can see that he started with us in 2018. That's the light blue lines. And we can see this is a eighth grader, by the way. He was performing at a fourth grade level in several areas. And in that short amount of time, for almost a year later, we were able to bump him up almost in every single category. And anywhere we didn't max out, this is maxing out, by the way, and this would be maxing out um, where the, the highest spot the tests go. Um, we would go back and revisit that. But this student is just continually blowing my mind. He was homeschooled. We were able to do this. Um, and then the next year, his family put him in school, in public school, and we thought, surely they're going to test him and put him in the right math. They did not. They dropped him in algebra, <laughs> and we were all holding our breath for that first month of school. We were quite worried about him. But because he had this very strong foundation and the confidence, he continued to just power through at school. He's getting A's. He's doing really well. He maintained that for a whole school year, and now he's into his next school year. He's rocking it. So it's a huge testament for how powerful multisensory math is when we're putting the information in that strength-based way, the visual, spatial, the concrete, and tying it and tethering it to that abstract idea. 
it helps these students be able to go into their long-term memory, pull it in and use it in a way that's meaningful to them. And so I love to share this data and he's not the only student who has this. This is just the one that I, I continually share. Um, I should pull in several, but we've got lots of kids that have had um, experiences like this. So be sure to check out our case studies. We celebrate the little wins too. Um, if you overcame some math anxiety, we celebrate that with you um, because it really can get in the way. And um, this particular student, I got an update from his mom. He's doing fantastic and everything we've taught him has been retained. He's not losing any of it. He's doing fantastic. And then I thought we should end with a little giggle tonight. I asked Adrienne Hedger over at Hedger Humor, and if you're not following her, you should. It's She's hilarious. She just gets like parent life. Um, but I asked her to help me, you know, display for us what it's like to do math homework. And so together we created six ways to get out of math, math homework according to kids. So this one happens a lot in my house. They get chatty. Oh my gosh, I didn't tell you what happened last Monday. Or they suddenly remember they have a chore. I have to deep clean my bathroom right now. Or they encounter that user error. I erased too hard and it ripped the paper. And then they're, you know, in a puddle of tears. And that's that. They become famished. I'm so hungry. I'm so thirsty. Or they suddenly care about that personal hygiene. Oh, I forgot to take a shower. I got to go. And then there's this one. I think a lot of kids do this one. They slowly disappear underneath the table because they just can't do it. We're melting into a puddle. Why are you sliding off your chair? Stop sliding. I'm sure a lot of you can relate. It's just so frustrating. Do you have questions about how dyslexia affects math? Drop them in the comments below. Online lessons are available for students everywhere. Connect with us here at madeformath.com forward slash contact. If you're interested in learning more about our lessons for students, please head to madeformath.com forward slash solo dash lessons.